Kolejny gość już teraz przed nami, bo bardzo nam zależy na tym, byśmy ukazali Państwu rolnictwo regeneratywne nie tylko jako modny temat do dyskusji, ale także jako pewien proces, także jeśli chodzi o ideę, który trwa. Mam ogromny zaszczyt powitać już za chwilę na tej scenie człowieka, który jest nazywany ojcem biologizacji. Opowie Państwu o biologizacji w rolnictwie. To jest nasz gość ze Stanów Zjednoczonych, Gary Zimmer, prezes Might Western Bio. A zapraszamy bardzo serdecznie, Gary. Nice to have you here. Thank you. I hope your travel to Poland was great. Please enjoy our stage. All right, thank you. Oh, how did that get there? Got to get rid of that. Oh, oh just a minute. So, uh, I have been involved with what we call biological farming for probably 40 years. I'm a dairy nutritionist by training, and I got into soils to create better food for cows. And so we were really, in our country, biological and organic aren't confusing. Organic is a separate thing altogether. So regenerative is now kind of a new term and a new language, and I have fun with it because if what we were doing was working so well, we wouldn't need to regenerate it. So what regenerative has got some issues, and of course it's new and it's young, and I'm sure they'll solve them. And the issues are the fact that there's really no, everybody uses the term and, and it's very vaguely used. There's no, what I call there, there's practices, but there's no rules. And so uh, with biological farm, we develop rules. That is a picture from my farm. I had a business and I worked with about 4,000 farms in the upper Midwest, right? Dead center in America against the Canadian border. And uh, a lot of them were dairy farmers. And, uh, and, and I wrote a book years ago, and I, I also uh, got quite involved in, uh, uh, besides uh, on, on the book end of it, I was not willing to just do the education part. We bought a farm, and then my children got involved in farming, and we have a fairly large crop farm. We went from dairy into cropping, and it evolved over the years. My first book came out in 2000, and then uh, the second book came out in 2010, and that book has now been translated into Spanish. And there's a whole big movement going on in Mexico. In fact, it's going on in Brazil and many other places I get also. And so it's nice to see the changes. Now this uh, uh, was my last book, came out about three years ago. The first book was 350 pages and now we're up to 500, and I need to write it again because I keep learning and advancing and new things. We're not stagnant. Our farm is changing. Uh, people's understanding of things are changing. And so anyway, that's kind of, I don't know if I'll write another book, but uh, uh, it is kind of a fun movement. I've been, it's certainly been exciting to be a part of this wonderful movement. Now, everybody doesn't like this statement because I say, in my 40-year career, we have it all figured out. We understand this thing. We have the basis figured out. We understand that there's minerals involved. We understand that there's certain nutrients. We understand there's a ratio between those minerals. We understand that, that besides the, the ratio, that there's certain sufficiency levels. I don't care what soil lab you use or where you go. There's a, if you take that test and get your soil test back, whatever is short we want to add, and if you, don't, if you got too much of something, you certainly wouldn't want to add more. Those minerals are interactive with one another. We understand that all. We understand there's different sources. We also understand that biology, you need to create an ideal home and you need to feed them. And you have to have, to have a diversity in the soils, you need a diversity of plants. It took me a long, long, long time to realize that the plants determine the biology. It's not the other way around. So the diversity of plants is the diversity of biology, and that's how you suppress some of the diseases and insects and other issues that are going on. Besides the diversity of plants, also pull and extract different minerals. So diversity is really a big part of it. And we know the soil life wants its food on top, and it wants to be left alone. And so, There are things out here, you, you, people grow crops, that it's impossible to follow this ideal model of no-till and minimal, you, know, you can do minimal disturbance. So every so often, I mean, if you're, the crops you're gonna grow, if you do damage out there, whether that damage is from tillage, or that damage is from chemicals, or that damage is from whatever you're doing for the crop you're growing, you need then to, how, to address that, and somehow, whether you put on compost or do something different, and I'll talk about my farming system there toward the end. And the last one, we understand tillage. Most research is comparing plowing to doing nothing. 
And somewhere in the middle, I'm a real believer in shallow incorporating residues and putting a blanket on top of your farm. The only real advantage to no-till is it leaves a blanket on top of your soil to protect it from the sun and the rain drops washing your soil away. Because in nature, there aren't very many bare soils. And so, besides that, you have jobs as a farmer. If it's, you're driving out there with heavy equipment and you're packing it and you're doing things in there, we really believe in running an inline ripper to get the water to drain down because soils can't be waterlogged in function. Now, <laughs> these are my rules to biological farming. And I realize it's, it covers the whole basis. Now, if your English isn't good, and if it isn't good, I didn't expect you to read that all. I did have a, a handout on some of these things. So I came out with these rules in the 1990s, and they cover three areas, which I'll keep referring to. The chemical, which is the nutrients, the physical, the structure, and the biology. So my, whoops, how would I do that? I thought that was supposed to be a marker. It didn't show up that way. Wait a minute. Uh, I guess I'll leave that alone. But anyway, the uh, biological farm, my first rule up here is I want to test and balance the soil. We got to put some scientists in. We got to have a basis of understanding that thing. But then I want to choose fertilizers that are more life friendly. See, the fertilizers that we use today are sold on solubility. They're not sold on performance. It was a higher soluble numbers. And so I want to balance the soluble to soil release. I want to choose fertilizers and nutrients to add to my soil that are more life friendly. I want to serve, there's a lot of evidence and research on those kind of nutrients. So the first whole thing is about it. We actually make our fertilizers low in pH. I have a, I had a business and we worked with all these farms and we manufactured fertilizers. And then I want to control the pH of the fertilizer, but also the soluble to soil release. And so our numbers would look quite different. So we put a lot of effort in to how we're going to deliver minerals that are missing from the soil. The second thing is that herbicides, pesticides, nitrogen, when minimum amounts, if we're truly going to put more carbon in the soil, we're going to have to really back off of nitrogen. Nitrogen is always balancing out the carbon. So the more nitrogen you throw on, the more carbon you release. And so, and then we need this diversity, which I man mentioned, and tillage is to manage the decay of residues and to control air and water. In our country, because I grew in an area with a lot of maize and soybeans, uh, strip tilling. So instead of farming like this, we're gonna farm like this. And in that little strip, in that little zone, is like putting a flower pot on every plant and we can concentrate and put our nutrients in there because 40% of the land that's farmed in the area I live is rented and nobody wants to fix it. They only got it for maybe a year that sent out on the highest bidder. So by strip tilling, there's a, that's probably the biggest movement. And if you go to a no-till conference, it's like going to a, an alcohol anonymous kind of meeting. It's like a bunch of recovering no-till farmers. It's really fun to attend a strip till conference. You really learn a lot about their failures. So they went into another strip till system. And then I got to feed the soil life something. It's my facilities I just want to show you in Wisconsin. When I started my business, that's what we had, NPK and cheapest wonderful sources and uh, this is how we these are the nutrients we brought into the fertilizer facility and it's kind of interesting because uh, uh, I chose things that were timed release and then we started manufacturing fertilizers with carbon to put a nutrient on the soil and hope that the plant can suck it up you are dreaming but to put it with a carbon source and get it in the carbon biological cycle you have a chance of that getting into the thing out here. I brought on, I'm getting older, and I brought on investors, and we started manufacturing fertilizer on the back of anaerobic digesters. We got these big farms, five, 10,000 cows, with a massive amount of manure, and so there's now three of those under construction, so we take the stuff out of the digester, which is a biological material, because the biology broke down the stuff in the digester, and then we add other minerals to it. And that's why you see the, the Terra New Calcium, the Terra New Micro Pack, the Terra New Ignite, that Terra New is our digestate fertilizer with minerals added, and we've had very good results to it, although we've had a lot of troubles and a lot of mistakes, and so now we'll get that perfected. And then we do liquids, and uh, we're the ones that, because I'm a dairy nutrition guy, we always fed molasses to cows, and soils and cows are very similar. I tell people, if you can't find agronomy help, go get a hold of your dairy nutritionist and have him explain how to take care of soils. Because us people with cow, they're both biological systems. They both depend upon digestion. And so, and so that uh, uh, 
the dairy end of the whole, whole thing out here, I was getting that out, I, I, I want to get that, uh, the liquid part was the molasses, because see, we fed molasses to cows, and it wasn't because molasses is a cheaper energy source, it's because it's a biological. Now we're putting it in the soil, and everybody says molasses is sugar. And everybody says, well, we got to add more complex carbons. The plant photosynthesizes, and I don't have the data up on this stuff here, and it produces a lot of exudates and a lot of sugars and soluble carbohydrates. The new research that's going out by Jerry Hatfield, USDA researcher in Iowa, is that the carbon is sequestered by liquid carbon. So the healthier your plant, the more it photosynthesizes, and half of that juice goes down in the soil, and then the organisms make the complex carbons. It's not adding the complex carbons to the soil that make the complex carbons, it's having the plant do it for you. So anyway, we add a lot of molasses to sugar and that got started over here and many other places in the countryside. And then we got our calcium sources. This is on a farm I work with and uh, the little round circles up there are called earthworm castings and it's a beautiful soil and it's, uh, it's he does not grow cover crops, he does not put on compost, it's corn soybeans and you're gonna hear when Kyle speaks later, him and his dad and I are the same age and we went to training together, we're both trained out of the same network about Brookside Albrecht soil balancing and we were told 40 years ago, if we got our minerals right, the soils would take care of themselves. There's nothing been done to this soil but adding the minerals. Now, this is, he's a strip-till farmer and it's a large farmer in Iowa and uh, you can see, if you look in there, you'll see earth going to loose, crumbly, chocolate cake type soil. So he came to me and said, I have stalled out. I've had really good increases. I got healthy crops and my yields have stalled out. And I, he thought he may need to put on more nitrogen. And I said he needs to do something besides just putting on the minerals and growing the crops. There's never been a cover crop on this land. So make sure you don't ignore the minerals to get soil back healthy. I'm not gonna go through, these are our soil tests. Why do you take a soil test? Well, you need to know what type of soil this is. You need to know, uh, look at the phosphorus and the potassium. Those are important things. You need to look at the calcium and magnesium. I need to know what kind of a soil it is because I know how much it takes to change it, what I gotta add. And then I also need to look at the traces and I wanna have uniformity of my soil test. But a soil test will not tell you what the crop can produce, only what it contains. Do you realize that was in 1897, the Bailey series from Cornell University? They weren't so dumb back years ago as people thought they were. So a soil test is what it is and it's not the hear all end all to try to make a perfect looking soil test is not the whole objective. The, the soil test doesn't tell you whether there's nutrients are available. The soil test doesn't tell you what the biology is like. The soil test doesn't tell you what the soil is loose and crumbly or as hard as a brick. And that's why there's other things you have to look at besides that. So there's two things that work. I've taken soils and I separated them out to soil correction. What are you gonna add to fix what's missing? And I take that soil test to make some corrections on the minerals and I, might, I don't have to do it in one year, although on my own farm we do quite things quite so different. And then there is the crop fertilizer. I separated those out because someone will come along if I say, you gotta spend all this money, they say, well that's more fertilizer dollars than I have. So if I separate out soil correction, it's like putting a new roof on the barn. Once it's done, it's done. So we separate that from crop fertilizer and that's taking care of that crop, that need, or add things that are there because my soil's missing them. So that has helped a lot of farmers understand this by separating out soil correction from crop fertilizer. And then uh, years and years and years went by and I kind of thought that I'd be able to put down a starter fertilizer, put some fertilizer down on top of the seed and I have a totally different concept of that now. Those fertilizers on that seed really need to be like a cluster mix. We like to put some molasses in there, we like to put a biological in there, we like to put some kelp in there for root stimulation hormones, we like to put some fish fertilizer in there. We're doing everything we can to create that ideal zone around the seed to get it up faster, get it growing better and to stimulate a bigger, better root system. We don't want to put fertilizer on top of the seed. The plant, when we plant it, doesn't need fertilizer that day. It needs to think that it's in a wonderful world and it's going to do really well. And so it, it doesn't know that two feet away, it might be awful. So we go after what I call a cluster mix in our starter fertilizers. So then soil fertility, I've been talking about these minerals, is really, the, it's the exchange of those minerals. That's why we go through that carbon biological cycle. And so soil fertility is the maximum level of nutrients that are exchangeable. 
This is on our farm in Wisconsin, and uh, this is a cover crop we had following our, our, our farming system. You can see a little white rod down there. I measured a two square foot diameter, and this was in my cover crop. These minerals are not in the soil test, but I now have those minerals that are here, I just put up the main ones, are now trapped in those plants. They can't leach, they can't erode, they can't get away, and they're now gonna be timed release. And if you notice that mix was about three tons per acre, which is now, that's 670 pounds of sugar just in the above ground plants that I put back in my soil. So the, the plants, everybody says, oh, we gotta be more fungal dominated. I disagree. The plants are producing sugar to feed the bacteria, so why would I wanna take the bacteria out of my formula and put more fungal food out there? The plant wants bacteria food. So that's another whole dimension. And I want my minerals hooked to a carbon. That's where the humate. So it sucks, so I put something, so it's already hooked to something before I add it to the soil, and then it doesn't really matter how awful your soil is. This is a friend I work with out here. We got a, quite a project. We make what we call designer compost. So we make the compost, and then we have the minerals in the compost. We might take a field, and I got that idea from Australia. Uh, we take a field and take our test, and if that field might need extra potassium, might need extra phosphorus, maybe our, our own farm, we put sulfur and we put boron. So we put the minerals in the compost pile. You can see the little white dots on the compost pile. So we make a designer compost. So now I got my minerals in that carbon biological cycle as we cook that compost. But here's the real thing that's going on. Everybody says, oh, we know how many nutrients it takes to grow the crop. This is nutrient use efficiency. And if you look at that, nitrogen is only 30 to 70% usable. I tell people, they said, we know how much nitrogen it takes. I said, then what's all that stuff down in the Gulf of Mexico? Where'd that come from? You must not have needed that. It's not even there anymore. Phosphorus, only five to 30%. So if we can get, and this is from 1990, in the last 10 years in America, I'm sure that's not true here. Look at the nitrogen use efficiency, just plummeted. So that's what regenerative is all about. Tapping into all that stuff you bought that's somehow tied up or unavailable to plants. So we gotta tap into that and regenerate. Most soils need a biological regeneration because we have a reserve of nutrients because we put so many on that the plant couldn't get. And now they're out into our soils. And so that's really a big part of things going on. So the microorganisms, zero to 70% of what you put on, the plant can't even get. It ranges so much. Let's talk tillage. Do you know where I got this picture? Poland. Not my first trip here. <laughs> I say, people, a moldboard plow is a double-edged razor blade in the hands of an ape, but every ape doesn't need to cut themselves. I said, one thing, if you do this practice, you got a little bit of work to get that regenerated. I, I, it's not, not the one I'd want to start with. I am sorry I had to pick on Poland, but I was here before with my camera. It is pretty incredible, isn't it? <laughs> I would do that in the back end of my farm so no one would see it. But see, I'm a real believer in shallow incorporating my residues because the fence post rots off near the top. The top couple inches, you can do whatever you want to. It's the middle zone I like to leave alone. You can see out here, if you take that plant in the top three or four inches, and that's why the strip till guys are putting an ideal, I say a flower pot on every plant, and they put their nitrogen in to do anything they can to get this massive amount of root systems and earthworm channels, and then the next crop can follow that channel. And so we have tubes out here for the following crop to grow, but you can do anything you want to the top couple of inches. That's not gonna, the middle zone's what we gotta leave alone. That's why a chisel plow or a moldboard plow does a similar kind of damage. We've got a big, to help you Germans, we have a big Lemkin disc. It's a bloody expensive tool that breaks down and the parts are really expensive because we had to get them from Germany. And so, but it was the first one in our country. We, I brought the first one over that we use. It's a kind of a high speed disc, but you can see how we farm. That's a big, kind of, a lot of cocktail mix of residues. But see, we leave a lot of stuff on top of the ground. So we've had to learn to farm with a blanket on top of our saw. So we got roll cleaners on our planters. We do all kinds of things out there. And then, uh, of course, there's the other thing that we have to put some of the residues in the soil. What's the number one yield limiting factor on crop production? Carbon dioxide. Yes. As the environment gets more carbon dioxide, your yields go up. And the reason for that is, the, there's, you got, that's why you can't have a crust on your ground. That's why air's gotta go in, and the plants, the biology is breaking down the residues and releasing carbon dioxide. The stomata on that plant are on the bottom of the leaf. 
The plant was not designed upside down. That's made to absorb gases. It's when you put your nitrogen on out of season. It's when you till when there's no crop going. It's when you, you do action and, and, and are releasing carbon dioxide, but nobody would catch it. If you had something there to catch it, your crop would do better and the, and the carbon dioxide wouldn't get in the atmosphere. We also run big rippers, but see, we're leaving middle zone alone. I live in the hills of southwestern Wisconsin, and we're not a very big farm in that terms, but we don't do this all the time, but if it's wet, or we had cattle out there and they did compaction, we'll run our inline rippers through, and so we'll do, it, it cuts the slot so water can soak in and has a little lifting effect on that tool. That was the tillage part of it, so my last thing will be on the biology. This is what my ancestors are from Germany, and when they came to America and the prairies were cleared, this is what virgin soil looked like when they took over. This is from Australia. This is a virgin prairie soil that's been tilled up. It looks like a loose chocolate cake. The farmer that did this, I told him I'd stop and see him every 10 years. I wanted to know how long it would take him to destroy this. A couple times plowing, you can do really well. So that's the great forgetting. We forgot where we came from. Now you'll try to get back there. I've been on a lot of farms like, you're a long ways from getting back here. I can tell you that. So soil health, and this is our government. Our government does some wonderful things once in a while. And so <laughs> I put that up. The soil health, is they say it's the capacity to function. And I wrote without intervention. I'm in my upper 70s, and if I was up here, I'd feel pretty healthy. If I had to take 25 pills to be able to stand upright, you couldn't call me healthy. I have no intervention in my body of that kind of intervention. But this is spot on. The water's got to soak in the ground. Nutrients got to cycle through plants and biology. You got to have minimum disturbance. It doesn't say no disturbance. You can't have a crust on top of the ground. It can't breathe. You got to have a lot of plant diversity. Us organic farmers, we got it made because we have weeds. We don't have to buy multi-cocktail plants, mixtures. We have, we grow our own. Living roots in the soil because they're exudating and putting sugars down to take care of the biology. And the government, by the way, did not write that word minerals on there. I did. And the reason is that because the government can't talk minerals because the soil science department would be offended if they said, you need to put on calcium, you need to put on sulfur, you need to watch your calcium magnesium ratios. Our country is not advanced far enough in the soil science department, but the agroecology people, a lot of others are looking at it, so minerals are critical. What are some main minerals to get soil healthy? Calcium, phosphorus, we always start balancing the soil with calcium and phosphorus. It's huge, and then we gotta manage the decay of residues. If you follow these principles, that's part of what getting soil healthy is all about. This is that farm in Iowa that's got, that never grows cover crops or anything else, and of course, soil health is plant health, and that's what we're all after, nutrient-rich, dense foods and places. I think what'll radically change the agriculture is we have to come up with tools that can measure residues and nutrient density in the food. Can you imagine if you had an app on your phone and you went to the grocery store and it told you how much nutrient density was there, how much nutrition was there, and how many pesticide residues were in it? Do you realize how fast we'd change agriculture? Absolutely, instantly. So, can we have too much soil health? That's my farm. I think we do a fairly good job. We're pretty fanatics about this thing. And uh, I need that aggregation. That's the purpose of my cover crops is to get that soil to look like a chocolate cake. And this is a couple of more farm examples and I'll wrap it up, is the fact that this is a farm in Colorado. What happened was I got involved with these farms. He's a potato grower. He's the highest altitude farming in North America. And it's one year soil building and one year potatoes. So it's every other year a potato crop. And that's his, that's his soil building. And the mustard is a, is a biofuming and that's a cocktail mix. But he can't, he works it down in the fall before the next year potato crop. And he puts compost on, he does all his minerals onto this thing, so it's one year soil building and one year production. And, uh, and I measured what's in that plant, and it's a biofuming it. There's a huge amount of sulfur coming out of that mustard, and so this, each plant does, does a different kind of a thing. So all these minerals are now tied up in this carbon biological cycle. He farms on sand in Colorado. This is another farm from Virginia, right near Washington, D.C. A million dollar CSA. And they, they, so if you're gonna have a small vegetable farm and sell it to farmers markets, we say one year soil building and one year growing vegetables. It's way too much work to try to farm and because it takes a lot of tillage and a lot of work. So if you do all that damage, you might grow three crops, you might start out with you know radishes and they might grow lettuce and they might grow something else. So you till it up and work it up all summer, well you better give it a year rest. Of course, this is the year of production, but they still got a cover crop between the rows and that's Swiss chard on plastic. This is my own farm. 
So over the years, we used to grow corn and soybeans and hay and everything else. My son farms by himself with a little help from my daughter, driving tractor once in a while. He farms 1,500 acres. He farms in a 45-mile circle all by himself on a certified organic farm because we can't get help. And so we have one year soil building and one year production. You can see this is rye and we joked about the rye. I plant the rye real thin. I'm more interested in the clover than the rye because there's no market for the rye in our country. People don't eat rye bread in our country. 0.7% of the population, yet it's really a health food. All the work in Denmark about hybrid rye and all those things, it's a lot of merit to what rye can do for your health. So, but I don't have a market. Most of our market goes to cover crop seeds. So we underseed it with clover. And then uh, this is what it would look, we just leave all the straw, clip the clover during the growing season. So we take one year of rye soil building and then the next year it's corn. So then all that residue and all that stuff, that's how our soils look like they do. We stick that all back into the ground. And then in the following spring, there we are with our Mr. Germany tool. <laughs> and uh, shall we incorporate that back in? But you see what this is? We're dairy people. We gotta watch digestibility. You feed that feed to a cow and you can get milk out of a cow. If you let it get big and rank and mature, it's too slow in digestibility. If you're growing cover crops, you need to add the word digestibility to your formula. How fast do I want it to break down? You know how fast that'll break down? I, I want it to be fertilizer. See, we don't buy any fertilizer on this farm anymore and I own the fertilizer company. I sold it now. So, and then we harvest our corn. If you've ever been around, I don't know if people are even aware of Frank Lloyd Wright, School of Architect, Taliesin, we farm that farm. And so this is us out there harvesting our corn. So it's one year soil building, one year corn. I've shared my economics. Everybody says, how can you afford that? I shared my economics at meeting after meeting and people, I don't they don't believe me or not. My son does really, 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 really well farming economically and it's a lot easier and there's built results. The only nutrients that we import to our farm are sulfur and boron. This is my last slide. I have field days, you know, I think it's the 15th of August this year. Uh, we'll bring a, quite a few people on my farm. I had field days for 25 years. It's a two day training with Acres USA. And at the field days, I went to the neighbors adjoining equal soils. And I dug up the roots and looked at them. And my maize plant had an incredible, nice ear on it. The genetic people did a wonderful job of breeding a plant that could tolerate the most awful, wonderful things that we do to it. We can throw chemicals and salts and ammonias and spray it with anything you want and see. But a week later, there's our soil on your right, and there's our neighbor's soil, both exactly the same soil. Depth. And that's called resilience. We've held moisture, we got more organic matter, and it was quite done on the ends of it. So that was my picture painting of the story. I don't know how much time I took, but thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yes, you Gary, thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Please stay on the stage. Okay. Take a chair, please.